Recording is on. Streaming is started. <clears throat> Let's make sure it comes up. We're on the air. I got it. I will excuse myself. Thank you, Doug. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Fredonia Central School District Board of Education meeting for Tuesday, May 19, 2020. Uh, if we could all stand for the pledge, that's how we st start every meeting uh, for a pledge. Thank you. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> yes. Thank you everyone for what is now what uh, the second full month of board meetings via Zoom. Uh, we have a uh, uh, proposed agenda for tonight's meeting. And if I could get uh, a board motion to approve those minutes. And if there's any uh, any changes, we can work on that. Okay. Can I get a motion to accept the minutes of the meeting? Okay, I don't know if I'm uh, live here. I think you're frozen. But I can't see anybody uh, raising hands, and I need. It's hands. Uh, Mr. Johnson Ms. was the first. Now. Made a motion and a second. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, is there uh, anything for the the meeting that we need uh, discussion on? If not, all those in favor of accepting the agenda, please signify by raising your hand. Six, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we start out with uh, the administrator's report and the budget discussion, uh, which will take up uh, obviously a majority of this meeting tonight. But uh, Mr. Certisio uh, and Mr. Forbes, Thank you, Mr. Aldridge. Uh, I'll be brief and uh, turn this over to Mr. Forbes momentarily, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to again talk about this important work in terms of the 2020-21 uh, uh, school budget. Um, there have been some significant changes since we last met. Uh, if you recall, the charge was to reduce expenditures and um, consider uh, appropriate use of fund balance in order to uh, finalize a budget that is supportive of instructional programs, but also is fair mm -hmm. to our community, particularly in light of our current economic situation. Uh, Forbes, if you will. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> what we decided to do tonight is to give you a more comprehensive package of slides than you've seen in the last couple meetings uh, for a number of reasons. One, because I wanted to see, have you see the progression of where we're at and two, because I think there were some questions generated last time that perhaps we didn't have enough information for. So uh, in the um, information that was sent to, um, to you by Christine, there should have been two documents. One was the proposed budget draft, uh, which is about 29 slides or so. And the second was the comprehensive uh, review of expenditures and budgets going back four years and including the proposed draft for 2021. So hopefully you had an opportunity to look through those. I'll go through these slides as I do. Feel free to ask questions or if you prefer to wait to the end, that's fine too. So <clears throat> the first slide talks about the fact we have no final state aid adjustment. 
Uh, I think we had spoken last time that there was anticipation of bad news coming from the state in a relatively short order. Um, the 15th had been the date that had been kicked around. Then that moved out to early this week, and now it could be any point after this. Um, so we really don't know what that's going to be. My understanding, and I think Mr. Sotisio will agree, is that the state is waiting for the federal government to make their decisions, and then the state will make the rest of the decisions that they have to make. This budget also does not include the final assessed values, the final equalization rates, or the final fund balance for the year. Those are normal at this time of year. The assessment and the equalization rates don't come in until August when we do the tax levy. And the final fund balance, of course, cannot be known until we have completed the fiscal year. Since the last time we met last week, we've reduced an additional 265,000 on the expenditure side. And there have been a couple of adjustments on the revenue side, which I'll talk about when I get to there. Uh, running through these, just so that you have a, a handle on what we did, um, we are replacing only a half-time PE teacher. That's for retirement. Uh, so there was savings on salary there and also the bottom line, which is Social Security. We had some adjustments to the non-instructional line. This when we went back through. We made sure that we had the minimum wage adjustments covered and a couple other items there. Uh, BOCES gave us a little bit of a nice surprise this week. They decided to go back and look at their capital expense line, which was running about 92000 in the last draft. And they've gone in and taken a look at the projects they had on the table, decided to push some of those off. And ultimately, we were able to reduce by 51000 <clears throat> That left us with 41000 in the capital projects line for BOCES, which is typical. Last year was a little bit over 40000 uh, in that line. Uh, BOCES uh, Services Special Education, from the last draft, we were able to move uh, one more high cost student off the books due to the resolution of a homeless situation. Uh, we had anticipated at least bringing that position back to Wheelock, but it ended up we could remove it because the family didn't respond by their deadline. We also were able to move two one twelve one students at the high school level uh, back into the high school for next year, and the combination of those three was 174000 I did have uh, one minor adjustment on the maintenance contractual expense line of 1700, as well as a put back of 675 for a textbook adjustment. Debt service principal and interest. Uh, Mr. Sotisio and I had a lengthy conversation with Maggie at Mr. <coughs> Solutions last week, talking about our debt on the $8.5 million project, comparing the numbers that we had projected before the pandemic with the numbers that are there now due to savings and interest and so forth. So we had a principal adjustment upward of 10,000 and interest adjustment down of 11,000. So a net slight savings there. I was also able to reduce the benefits I was carrying on the phys ed position, which was a family insurance plan. Um, so we were able to reduce that. So that ran total 265,000 of expenditure reductions since the last time. Taking a look then by major category, uh, salary and benefits, you're up 0.28%. Um, you can see the distribution across instructional, non-instructional, and benefits. Um, the big driver here is the reduced TRS rates, teacher's retirement system rates, on 1920 salaries. Uh, there is an expectation off the pandemic that those rates will change, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, in this budget for salary and uh, staffing, we have the five retirees, uh, grade three, five, five, six, and phys ed. We have replacements of 4.5 teachers there. Christine, if you could advance to the next slide, that would be good, please. Thank you. Uh, and those are estimated at a step of step four with 30 hours and a master's based upon the current FTA contract. And we do have all five of those individuals <coughs> eligible for the retirement. This is a slide you've seen previously. I wanted to make sure I included it. <clears throat> Salary and benefits. Um, going back into the teacher's retirement discussion, as I said, it was a drop of 10.8 to 8.86% for 1920 salaries. The expectation is that those rates will increase based upon however all of this pandemic finance works out with the state. But to give you an idea, uh, when we last had something at least partly similar, which was the gap el elimination adjustment in 2010-11, in that year, the rates were 8.62%. Going into 11-12, they jumped up to 11.1%. 13, 14, 16.2, and 14, 15, they were up to 17.5. At that point, 
the gap elimination was restored and we began to see the rates slide back down. But just to give you an idea of what that might mean, a rate increase of 8.8 to 12% as an example is about $450,000 of additional expense for that line item alone. So you can see that that could be a rather significant driver uh, in the subsequent year, the 21-22 budget year. So just putting that out there. And to take a look across the rest of the benefits, uh, no real jumps there, 50% on unemployment, that's only a $5,000 change there. Health insurance was very minimal based upon uh, the retirees we had and some people changing plans and so forth. So overall uh, benefit area is down 179,000 or 2.7%. Equipment, materials and supplies as a group were down 78,000. Uh, equipment were in comparison to last year, we're down 93. We have 84,000 remaining there. Materials and supplies district wide, which would be instructional and non instructional, you're up $14,000. The next slide is a representation of the equipment requests that are remaining in this budget. If we got to a position that we needed to cut all of those, either because we need to cut or because we had a defeated budget, it's required to be cut by New York State statute. You can see what those are um, in there. Not a lot of high, high cost, but remove the truck from the maintenance department. We've continued to keep in the musical instrument replacement and then you know, a variety across the instructional and non-instructional areas. <clears throat> Moving on then to contractual expense in BOCI services. Uh, we're now at a total for that category of $117,000 increase or 1.83%. Our contractual expense across the board, which encompasses Again, non-instructional and instructional, maintenance, custodial, all those were down 84,000. And our BOCES number went from a little bit over 600,000 in your last presentation to 200,000 in this presentation. Again, the special education high cost is a driver there. We had a number of students move in during the year, um, but we were able to bring some back too, so that took that number down to a more manageable figure. <clears throat> The next couple of slides just highlight some of the major changes uh, to the BOCI services of over, over 5,000, either an increased cost or 5,000 in savings. I won't go through them all, but you can see there is a lot of shuffle in the special area. You're up in 112.1, 1, 112.1 aids. You're down in 181 uh, regular and aids. The speech, the occupational physical therapy, individual and group, those are all things that are adjusted uh, often during the year based upon the individual student's needs and certainly at this point. Mm -hmm projecting for the ingoing students what they may need. Uh, iReady is a student evaluation program that would be new to us. The BOCES administrative line charge was up 5,600. There was a $7,000 change on our VoIP, which is our phone lines for the PRI lines. Uh, we're switching to a different kind of science kit, so there's some upfront charge with that. And then we have a decrease in the ethernet services of 13,000. Our occupational education rate is based upon uh, actual counts from October and February, and we were down about 14 students in comparison to last year. So that's a, a decrease of 134,000 there. Uh, there was also an opportunity to, uh, to add an aid there for one of the students. Um, we've got increase in P-TECH. We added three slots after the budget was approved last year. So that totaled 61,000. Uh, we're up for a consultant teacher for the Alt-Ed program, a decrease in library systems and a $5,000 Increase in our WinCap support. WinCap is the program that is used for a number of things in the district, including uh, us looking at attendance module this year for staff attendance. Uh, debt service and fund transfers. Uh, you can see the distribution there. As I mentioned at the onset, we did have a change in the projections for principal and interest, and that's reflected in this slide. The next group of slides uh, before all together are a review for the board of the building level budget summaries. You can see across the bottom is the total um, by year. So taking a look at the primary school at the start, uh, you can see that we've gone from 3,000 when we really had not a lot of activity there to up to 23,000 now with kindergarten and UPK both there. And that's not completely unexpected given that you added class level there. Uh, elementary school, you can see that uh, Mr. Drollinger took us from 106 in 1920 down to 83,000. So all the principals did a great job going through and helping us trim what we could. Middle school, uh, see the progression across the bottom there. You're down from 1920 
from 136,000 to 85,000. And finally, high school, 158,000 to 134,000. And again, I'd like to thank the principals for their efforts to help us reduce where they could. And certainly their, their building staff as well. <clears throat> so taking a look then at your proposed budget summary, we're at $30,666,526, which represents a $359,789 increase, which is 1.19% 1 over 1920. Moving on to the revenue side then, uh, found, the foundation aid pandemic adjustment slide is one you've seen before. Um, this includes 315,000 of a pandemic adjustment deduction, which is then offset currently by the federal CARES restoration of 315,000. And again, the stress here is that there is language in the state's budget to allow a reduction of that, of our aid by that pandemic amount. <clears throat> Taking a look then at the distribution of our revenue sources, you see state aid has gone up 54,000, which is all in categorical aid, and we'll see that slide in a second. Our local sources were down 2,000, our federal aid were up 10,000. We've applied an additional 56,000 of unassigned fund balance to this budget draft, and our tax levy stands at a $240,000 increase. Taking a look further then at the local categories, most of these don't change on a year to year basis, uh, just because there's not a lot of change that occurs in, in these kinds of areas. The admissions, as an example, tends to run about the same on a year to year basis for our sports. Uh, tuition from other districts is based upon a couple of students that were servicing from Forceville, and the expectation is those students will remain, so the price will be approximately the same. Interest, I did make an adjustment from last time. Um, I had been carrying 30,000 and talking to the people that I talked to about this kind of stuff, there just is not any glimmer of hope in the short term that the rates will return quickly. And it would be a little bit foolish of me to keep 30,000 in there where it's not gonna be possible likely. If it is, then that's good because it, it helps our fund balance. Uh, rent reflects all the rents from uh, Wheelock School. BOCES refunds, I took a look at the last few years history of the refunds that we receive on services that we budget for and then ultimately don't use. So I feel comfortable increasing that line by 10,000. So the next page is our state and federal breakdown. As you may recall, Governor Cuomo and the legislators pulled back our foundation aid increase, so we're at zero in that line. The 56,000 that I had mentioned a few slides ago uh, is a breakout of all these other distributions. All of those are, you spend it to get it. If you don't spend it, you don't get it. So excess cost aid is our high cost students. I would anticipate in this coming year, we'll see an increase there based upon what we had this year. Building aid is based upon your actual building aid. Transportation aid is based upon the, the routes you run. And we still, by the way, don't have an answer on whether we need to pay for a student for April, May, and June. And if we did, if we get any aid back. So I've informed them uh, yesterday that we still don't have an answer. Hardware aid is based on the hardware you buy. Uh, BOCES regular aid, that's all the aid that you get against the services we purchase from them. Textbook and software, pretty much self-explanatory. And Medicaid reimbursement. And actually, before we move on, I think I found a typo there. So let me just make sure I'm giving you the right information. Yes, the Medicare line, um, I did not make the adjustment for, but I'm actually carrying $100,000 in 2021 and, and not 60,000. So there'd be a $40,000 increase there. That is reflected in the total. Program. So then taking a look at the totals from the revenue side, you can see local and federal are up 8,000, 1.35% change there. The state were up 54,000 as we just reviewed. Appropriated or assigned fund balance, we increased by 56,000 and your tax levy is up 240,000, which is a 1.5% change in your tax levy. You can see the distribution of what makes up our revenue side at the bottom between state aid and our taxes. The three years listed first, 16, 17 through 18, 19, those are a little bit higher because we were getting additional building aid at that point, as the board may recall, and that came off the books for the 1920 year um, from our Vision 2000. So that reflects a little bit of the change in the state aid. And then, of course, your tax levy would be the corresponding offset because your federal is only 600000 of a $30 million budget. Uh, again, to remind you about the budget caps, the administrative cap uh, still is in place. We need to not exceed that percentage of the prior year's budget. So what they do for that calculation is you add your total programming cost, which is all instructional, and your total administrative cost, which is the offices, the print shop, maintenance 
um, custodial, all those kinds of things, then you cannot exceed uh, the prior year's percentage, which is 1305. We're currently at 12.44, which is 167,000 under the cap. So we're in compliance there. Uh, overall tax levy limit, which we'll get to in the next slide, is in, in place of the overall budget cap. And if you were to choose to do an override, you need 60% majority, which we're not in that situation. The tax cap on the next slide uh, has a change from last time. The maximum tax levy percentage increase that we had previously was 3.85 with the change that BOCES made to their capital line this year of the $50,000 reduction and the fact that New York State this year allowed us to take BOCES services and into consideration as part of our tax cap formula. We did have a change there. So it went from 3.85 to 3.76. Again, really not much of a, a big um, hit there because we were already below it anyway, but just pointing that out. And taking a look at where we stand today, we're 362,000 below what the uh, tax cap would allow us to be. And we are at the tax levy of 1.5%. On the next slide, I've listed for you uh, our comparison of our actual tax levy in comparison to what our limit would be going back to its implementation in 2011-12. I will tell you that on the 1920 line, where it says 1.46%, that should actually be 2.95%, uh, but we were below it anyway. So five of the nine tax cap years, the board has set a levy that's been below what you're legally allowed to do. And then taking the information from the budget, proposal forward in comparison, you can see the distribution across going back to 2013-14. Um, part of this will be because we had such a large decrease in debt service cost and aid last year, or actually this year, 1920, but you're averaging a spending increase of 1.19%, excuse me, and a three-year increase, which is actually a decrease of 1.14%. And then taking a look uh, at projected tax rates and you may recall that things change occasionally in August when we get the final assessed value, the equalization rates. So just to show you that illustration for 1920, you had a budget vote where you projected a zero rate, which is the middle column. Once all those figures came in from the assessors and the state, we actually had decreases across the board uh, and we did the levy in August. And then I've listed on the left-hand side what the tax rates are using the proposal in front of you today. A dollar on the tax rate in the town of Pomford is an approximate reduction of $130,750 and a 1% change in spending is $303,000. The final two slides are updated to reflect uh, where we are in terms of levy versus options you may choose to, to use or not use. So you can see towards the bottom of the, or actually the middle of the page, you have the tax cap line, which was a 3.85% initially. It's now 3.76%. And then I've broken out for you the distribution <clears throat> of where you are. Uh, basically for every half a percent you change now, you'd have to eliminate a little over $80,000. If you were to go to a zero, you'd be looking at 240,000. Um, and based upon the fact you had a zero last year and based upon the fact that you have lots of potential things coming that will not be good for the district, it would be my recommendation to not go to zero and, and look at something other than that. But um, that's what you'd have to do if you chose to do that. And then finally, I plug those, that information into the fund balance assignment. Uh, you can see the estimate right now is that we would start July of 2020 at approximately 9.48%. And if you were to put another 240,000 towards the unassigned amount, you'd be down to 7.56%. We had talked last meeting and in the past, both at audit committee and at the board level that you weren't particularly comfortable at 11%, but you were more comfortable in that seven and a half to 9% range. And I think you're on target right now to do that. So at this point, I would either offer Mr. Sertissio an opportunity to comment or entertain any questions. Well, Mr. Forbes, thanks for your, for your work and your thoroughness. And uh, I certainly appreciate all that you've done. And I also want to thank the, the administrative team as well as those, those uh, folks that they support and supervise in their efforts in, in um, bringing this, fi this final budget uh, recommendation for the board's consideration. I do want to point out a couple of things and, and just repeat some things that you said. Is I did indicate at our last meeting that we anticipated 
hearing about uh, an update on state aid uh, by May 15th. And then, and then I heard later in the week, it was May 20th. Uh, I did reach out to some lobbyists and some advocates in Albany over the weekend and was informed that the earliest we should expect to hear uh, about any updates in state aid is the end of May. Um, that's problematic for a lot of reasons. Uh, boards across the, across the state are being asked to adopt or being directed to adopt the budget within a, a four day window, which started yesterday and ends on Thursday, um, to, with the best knowledge that they currently have, with the understanding that that may change. Um, it will change for the better, okay? I do not anticipate an influx of federal funds or the state finding some, heat, some additional funds in providing other school districts. Um, our best case scenario is the state aid that we have today is the state aid that we, that, that we have in the, in the future, uh, uh, um, meaning the end of this month and into next school year. Um, it's important though to consider that there may be state aid cuts. And if there are, um, after the budget is adopted, there's really only two means to, to fill that gap. And that is utilize more fund balance uh, and, and or in a combination with cutting expenditures beyond what's already been cut. Um, and I share this with you because your only opportunity to have an impact on a revenue source, and I don't like calling it that, um, but that's essentially what it is. The only opportunity to have an impact on that is the decision you'll make tonight in terms of what, uh, what levy you're willing to go forward with. So Mr. Forbes uh, has made a recommendation of 1.5%. It will not surprise you that we've had many uh, deep conversations over the weekend about how, can, how we can position the district uh, in the best position possible moving forward. And that is the percentage that, that we settled on. That 1.5% is a, is a modest increase for the taxpayers. Um, it is an increase though, and we have to be sensitive to, to the economic uh, plight of, of the community and the stakeholders. Um, but that 1.5% provides the district a, a semblance of some protection against potential deep state aid cuts. Um, I know this board and this administrative team um, wants to maintain the programs that have made this district so outstanding, some of which are new uh, to the district, but certainly I, I would say overdue in their implementation. Um, certainly there are some, some small minor areas and, and Mr. Forbes pointed out the area of, of equipment that we could make some uh, additional, uh, additional cuts to, but that, that amounts to about $84,000 and quite frankly, it comes with, with some pain to it as well. Um, so um, for those reasons, you, you know, I, I'd like to entertain a conversation with the board about what they're comfortable with. I do think that this uh, meets the stated goal from a year ago of, of whittling down on that fund balance, but it also provides enough fund balance to, to cover those expected state aid cuts. One thing I, I want to mention too, which I, I thought of it as you were talking, Mr. Sertisio, uh the question would be, what is the impact on a average home in the town of Pomfret at this uh, particular tax levy level? And the benchmark generally used by the assessor's office in the town of Pomfret, which comprises about 86% of our district, is to use a twenty-five dollars to $30,000 assessment, bearing in mind that the, the Pomfret has not had a reval in many, many years, so their equalization rates are low and therefore their assessments are low, but it's offset by the tax rates. Uh, you're really looking at somewhere around $50 on a tax bill at 1.5%. Is, is that, John, I'm, I'm, is that uh, $50 per thousand or is that $50? Um, 50, flat out. For the average homeowner, it yes. will be $50. Okay, yep. thank you. <clears throat> I, I didn't hear that answer. I'm sorry, yes, it's $50 total, not per thousand. Okay. Um, I know that we're gonna be getting into to questions here um, on this budget um, in, in about uh, 10 minutes. Now, 15 minutes. Um, if, if there's any quick questions, clarifications uh, prior to our discussion on uh, what 
what uh, where everyone is on this budget. Uh, are there any questions from the board? Uh, I, I have a question on uh, John's summary here in regards to uh, debt service transfers and that dollar amount, a little more explanation to that. Uh, what's the title of the page you're looking at, Mr. Hawk? Uh, debt service transfers. I be, I'm not looking at any page. I wrote it down after you went through it to ask questions. Okay. I, I just want to make sure I was answering from the right page. So <laughs> I can tell you exactly here. Give me one second to get on that screen. All right. Uh, <clears throat> basically, this is a principal and interest from any of the projects that we have uh, on the book still. So you're looking at the lease payment for the energy performance project of 140000 uh, Excel principal payment of 140000 a projection on the borrowing for the current project of 480000 480, And then on the other side, you've got an interest 56000 for the energy performance project, 94000 for the Excel project, and a projection of 183000 for the 8.5 million. You also have uh, $5,000 that I carry in there is uh, one is a fund balance and two in the event that we ever had to do any kind of short term note, uh, I carry $5,000 there. And then there's also $15,000 that I carry every year, which is a transfer to our federal fund to offset a portion of our um, federal grants that are not covered by the state. Okay, I apologize so when I'm answering a question, if I'm not looking at it, it's because I'm looking at another screen, so. That's fine. So, so my question is, is John, we're looking at a 30.25% increase from last year. Um, that's more so what, what I'd like to focus on. Due to the fact interest rates uh, are so low, uh, how is it that, and, and, and you know, I'm also looking at most of the debt services that we carry, um, the XL project and uh, total uh, bonded debt uh, on the uh, information booklet you uh, gave to us maybe about two months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any increases there. Matter of fact, uh, everything looks stable. You're absolutely correct. At that point in time, that's exactly true because that's a historical document. The changes that are driving the 30 point 30.25% uh, increase are the debt for the $8.5 million project coming onto the books. They were not on in 1920. Why weren't they? We knew the project was coming on. Because you don't bring on the debt payment for principal and interest until such point in time as you borrow and until uh -huh. such point in time as you mm -hmm. generate the aid. There is an offset of aid on the revenue side against that. So when, when we look at um, this dollar amount, in comparison to the increase in the tax levy, how much are we increasing the tax levy to cover our capital project of $8.5 million? Uh, get, again, if you could just bear with me one second, let me sure. add something up real quick. After you factor in the expense for uh, principal and interest, and then the aid that will come back against it, you're looking at a, a district cost of about 112,000, 113,000. Which equates to what percentage to tax levy? Less three quarters of a percent, 0.8 percent? Uh, probably pr pretty close, but I can tell you. <clears throat> Yeah, about 7%, 0.7%. Uh, John, if, if I could um, ask a, a quick question. You're, you're showing 840000 for debt service in 1920. It, that's down significantly from the 1819 budget. Is that correct? Because yes, because your, the, your uh, Vision 2000 debt came off in that year. So we didn't see any of the Vision 2000 in the 1920 budget. Is right. That That's correct. Okay. So, so Mr. Hawk, um, if you looked at the 1819 
budget. I, you know, I, I don't know what that number would have been, but it would have been much higher than the 840, probably in line with the uh, 2021 budget, John? The Vision 2000 was about 2.6 million in 1819. 2.6. So, so, so we won't receive a, <clears throat> this is the point that I'm trying to uh, understand. It's a one-time cost uh, as to an, uh, initially starting this debt service, and then we re will receive aid from the state. Is that correct? In each year moving forward, as they pay the aid, you right. have a situation that your there will be a local cost to it. You'll mm -hmm. have your debt will be fairly flat, and your aid will be fairly flat. So that will become your new level. But yes, right. Okay, so. Basically, this this expense is a one-time expense, to a per, to a to a degree. Um, if, then it becomes if, a if you looked at it from the point of view, is that it's a change, yes, uh, and then obviously it'll be expense for the number of years that the debt carries. Right. So it, it, I view it as like if we went and bought a truck, we put that truck in the budget, and we use that truck and 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 go forward from it. Um, all right. Well, I understand and thank you. You cleared that up. Um, then also, I want to get back to the BOCES. Uh, in your summary here, um, you had cut that down to approximately $320,000. Actually, it's an increase of two hundred and one, but yeah. Uh, it's an increase from last year, but it's a decrease from your proposal on your last budget proposal. Correct. Okay. Correct. So uh, we're, we're looking at that, um, that dollar amount. And would, uh, would we be receiving how much aid from the state? Your BOCES aid is approximately 70%. So we would be receiving next year 224000 of that money? Approximately, yes. Okay, so our portion is only 96000 Right, the expenditure side does not reflect any aid coming back, so yes, that's correct. Right, okay, all right. And, um, okay, and then my final question is to the aid reduction in the pandemic aid. Yes. Shed some light on that a little further. <clears throat> well, uh, what happened was the state has received an amount of money from the federal government. So in the process of running the state budget for the districts, they had a pandemic adjustment, which was what they anticipated at that point in time as being the hit to each district, and which is our, in our case is 315,000. And then because they do have promise from the federal government to provide additional aid to the state all states. Uh, they've offset that amount in our current aid run. So that right now it's a zero. There's no effect on the district. It's just the source of where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. So if, if the federal government were to say, you know, we're going to give you double, I don't think we'll get any more than we're getting now. I think the state will use that in other places. But if the federal government were to say, you're going to get a quarter of what you got now, then they have the opportunity to claw that back from the, the districts. Now, let me, let me jump in here as well. A really good question, Mr. Hawk. So the, the pandemic adjustment at 315,000, um, we are, um, by we, I mean superintendents, are being cautioned that the state may uh, claw back, as John just said, about 50% of that, of that adjustment. Um, there, and, and the reason it's at 50% is there's a, something that's called a, an MOA, and for the life of me, I can't remember what the M stands for, but the A is the assurances. And the assurances are an agreement between the federal government and the governors of the states that the money that the feds provide um, will be, uh, they will be assured that most or all of it will be used for the intended purpose, in this case, to, to offset educational, uh, uh, educational need. So within this budget, um, there is an expectation, and it's a very important point, that we, we may lose 50% of that pandemic adjustment, which is what, John, about $160,000? Yep. 
So, uh, Mr. Satoshio, can you speak to the question I asked last week in regards to a total federal allowance, either per student or per school district or per budget, as to what the federal government has allocated in the $1 billion to New York State? My question was, each state is allocated different dollar amounts. How did the federal government come up to the dollar amount they allocated to New York State? And what I, are I don't we... have an answer for you, Mr. Hawk. Try as I might. Um, I can tell you that um, people a lot brighter than me and a lot more involved uh, don't understand how New York State got the dollars they did versus some other states. Um, if you've heard uh, our governor speak, he has talked repeatedly that um, it, the dollar amounts allocated in New York State are nowhere near what um, what is needed based on um, how New York has been uh, affected by this pandemic, uh, not only in terms of the health crisis, but the economic crisis as well. Um, you know, I, I, I would be... Uh, I would be remiss if I, if I attempted to, to explain to you something that quite frankly really is unexplainable. That's fair. I believe Mr. Johnson has a question, Mr. Aldridge. Mr. Johnson. Uh, yes, for uh, Mr. Forbes, um, I, I wanna revisit what you mentioned about the teacher retirement system earlier in the piece. Um, I know that uh, uh, it's been mentioned in the past few meetings that you know we could see increased costs next year due to the uh, pandemic, but you you offered a bit of a quantitative value uh, based on historical data from 2009, and well, I I, I didn't quite catch what you said in terms okay. of how much it cost us during that period. Okay, uh, basically what I did is I went back and, and this information is readily available if you choose to Google it, but there's a, a chart that New York State Teacher Retirement has that shows there was an five all listed together. So what I did is I took a look at the 2010-11 rate, which was the year in which in the middle of the year they took the gap elimination adjustment cut. And then I looked at what may have happened to those rates after that because the cut was made because of poor economic conditions. So right away, it was a 8.6 to 11.1 percent change in the subsequent year. And for whatever reason, the next year didn't change much. It was uh, about 0.75 percent. And then there was a jump to 16 and to 17. So looking at where we are today and factoring in a similar economic condition that's developing, one could ascertain that we would see those kinds of jumps moving forward. And if we did, based upon the dollar value that we report to the system currently, you're looking at about 425 to 450,000 to go from where we are at 8.86 to roughly 12%. So if we were to go to 17, you'd be looking at over a million probably. So you're talking about in one year? Yep. yep. And, we're, and we're this year we were able to, to reduce that line item. Um, by about $150,000 because the rates went from 10.6 to 8.6. You're looking at the reverse of that if the rates go up. I, I fully expect next year at this time, you're gonna be talking about increased TRS and ERS costs and they're gonna be significant. Um, we, the, the, the district does have uh, an employee retirement uh, system reserve um, that it can utilize when costs are higher than unexpected. The district has the opportunity to create a teacher retirement system reserve, which was new starting this year. I do recommend that before the close of this fiscal year, um, the audit committee have a discussion uh, about uh, a TRS reserve. You can utilize uh, some inner reserve transfer to fund that reserve as well. Um, and some of, those, some of those reserves are more flexible than, than others. Others require uh, a board action, which is simply an agenda item that you discuss and, and vote on. But you have the opportunity today or nearly today to put some money away or, or utilize some money that's put away in a different, in a different fund, reserve fund, protect, to protect the district uh, next year and, and for years to come. All right, and just to follow up a little <clears throat> bit further with Mr. Johnson's question, the other thing that you take a look at in these kinds of situations is one, 
Is there an opportunity for uh, some type of local incentive, whether you reopen the window to anyone past it, or you offer something less than the, the, the window that you passed? Uh, so there's that to look at as a future potential savings. Also, there's rumblings amongst my peers that the employee's retirement system um, is looking at some type of incentive where they would reduce the requirements of 55 and 30 to 55 and 25, as an example of 25 years of service. I uh, have not seen that or heard that on the teacher's retirement side yet, but it's honestly a little bit early, I think, for that to come out. They're, they're not going to be quick to jump until they see what the full impact is across the board, in my opinion. And that's the st at the state level. Right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Forbes, Mr. Sardesi. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I can't see uh, any board members, but uh, if anybody could just uh, inform me if any board members have any questions. No? Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Certicio, Mr. Forbes, uh, thank you very much uh, for taking the time and, and effort to explain this, uh, putting this all out in, in a way that's uh, a little bit more, uh, more effort to this. It is, it's a very complicated uh, system uh, accounting uh, budget that we have here in, in very trying times. Um, I, I know that the, the board members have maybe a step up because we're so engaged, but uh, I know that uh, there's other people on this, uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting, uh, public that doesn't understand half of what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you taking the time and being diligent on that. Uh, it is critical. Um, I will tell you that this budget is uh, one of the most important things that our board does. And it's, uh, uh, it's critical that we understand what's going on not only with the budget, but what's going on in the community, what's going on uh, within the operations of the schools so that we can make the most informed decision. So, you know, all this information, uh, it may be boring to some, uh, to me with the finance, uh, the finance guy, you know, this is, this is candy to me. But uh, thank, thank you everyone for being patient uh, and understanding in, in this whole thing. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. Okay. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Aldrich. Uh, Mr. Aldrich. Yes. Um, I think we lost um, Lisa. Mrs. Fortna, um, and I think she has to go through Mr. Prince to get back on, right? I can let her in as well. So. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Forrester. Um, we will continue on, but Mr. Paskey, um, if you could, uh, Mr. Paskey and Ms. Ms. Piper, um, if you could discuss some new course uh, proposals for this coming year. Hi, sure. First, let me apologize. I've got uh, construction going on at my neighbor's house and uh, some lawn mowing going on. So if it gets loud, I apologize. Uh, I want to start off by, by thanking, first off, Jeff for formalizing this process. Um, for, for many, many years, long before I was principal, uh, the new courses at the high school were just kind of uh, thought of, run by the principal, and decided, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, let's do it. And um, so we, we uh, formalized the process, and uh, I have to thank Amy Piper for, for her work with really researching uh, the, the types of, of course proposals that, that are out there and developing something that was really user-friendly and appropriate for the Fredonia district. So thank you, Amy, for, for doing that. Um, the, to, to offer new courses at the high school, the, uh, the proposal form is actually three pages of information that we gather. Um, and so a department had typically uh, would propose this to the principal uh, just to, to run through some of the, the details that they need to include. 
Uh, it starts with a course description uh, and then moving into needs assessment and describing why we actually need uh, a, a course, a new course. Um, and then, then on to a systems check where we, we go through first off to make sure that we're not offering uh, the, this a very, very similar course already that's meeting the needs of our kids. Uh, checking on NCAA requirements and if, it, if it's going to be approved for the NCAA process. And uh, lastly, to, to check on uh, course alignment and whether or not this is going to offer any type of, of college credit for, for the students. Uh, it, it continues with uh, giving us a, a listing of, of how, how they plan to assess students uh, appropriately throughout the courses. Uh, it includes a, a full syllabus for the course um, and then how the course fits as far as sequencing goes. You know, do, does it fit with the other courses that are already there? Or is this kind of a standalone course that may or may not lead to anything? And so it, that's an important piece for us to, to examine as well. Um, the, uh, the, the cost analysis and, and uh, implementation needs is also a consideration. And uh, I, I'm very happy that for, for the three courses that were proposed this year, um, it's going to be no, no increase in next year's budget uh, to, to offer the three courses that were proposed this year that uh, we, we are planning on, on hopefully running unless there's a, a derailment of the budget uh, for next year. Um, so I just wanted to briefly go through what the courses are um, and just to let the board know what we're adding. Uh, the first course I wanted to discuss is topics in geometry and algebra two. Uh, we currently have 14 kids signed up for, for that new course. And uh, unforeseen when we looked at this proposal was the, the pandemic and, and maybe some of the needs of our kids have changed. And, and I think that this might be applicable to some more students as we move forward. Um, and th this course is designed for students completing our two year algebra course. Um, and typically uh, those students have completed the two years to, to get the algebra regents under their belt, their graduation requirement. And many of those students did not go on to take another regents exam ever. Um, they would either A, take a non-regents course for their third math credit, or B, uh, they would get a non-regents credit from attending BOCES in a CTE, a career technical education course. Um, so our, our goal in this class is to uh, give kids in a third year math class uh, topics that are from both regents geometry and algebra two. Uh, those two courses are very, very different from each other, but they could take a regents in either one. And it will give them some topics and some exposure to each of those, those courses and build a foundation for them to then as a senior go on and take a regents level class that uh, will end in a regents and hopefully get more of our kids uh, through to an advanced regents diploma. So th that was uh, pretty much the goal of that course and we're hoping that that's gonna be very successful. The, the second course is adding AP World History and uh, AP World History, uh, there are 43 kids signed up for that for next year. Um, students will be uh, looking at historical connections and crafting historical arguments uh, as they explore a, a lot of uh, interesting topics like uh, humans and the environment, cultural developments and interactions in government, uh, economic systems, social interactions, technology and innovation. And the introduction of this course uh, will provide a, what we would say is a truly advanced experience. Um, currently, students are enrolling in what we call Advanced Global 10 in 10th grade, and that's really just the Global 10 curriculum spiced up a little bit, but it, it's not at a level that, that's a college level AP course, and it's not necessarily preparing kids as well as we could for moving on in the AP curriculum up to the AP US history. So uh, they, they feel that this is going to be a, a, a better challenge for our students, a more appropriate course, and it covers all of the important topics from the, the global 10 that they would take the regents in still, but also give them the AP exam at the end of that class. So, and then as they move on as a junior, many of those kids would go on to take AP US history. The third course is AP biology, and we have 29 students signed up for that for next year. Uh, the AP Biology course is an introductory college level course uh, where students will, will cultivate their understanding of bio, biology through um, inquiry-based 
investigations and they'll explore topics in evolution, energetics, information storage and transfer and system interactions. And the, the interest in this course was born from a really strong desire from, from our students who are pursuing higher education in the medical fields. And this course relates quite significantly to that. And uh, this also fills a gap in the science department that they don't have very many electives. And I think that this is a, a great addition to it. And as I said, for all three courses, uh, we're able to purchase the textbooks and materials through this year's budget. So there will be no additional monies needed from the upcoming budget. So if that helps you decide tonight, uh, please let that happen. I, Lisa, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Paschke. Just on, so the AP World History is that replacing the advanced global 10 so that goes away and then you have the, is it the regents and then this becomes the other option correct so we, we will have a regular global 10 and then the kids who typically enrolled in the advanced 10 are going to enroll in the, the ap world history and they will, it, all of the stuff that they need for the Regents exam at the end of that year is embedded in that course, plus the AP curriculum. And the, the department really demonstrated that that's going to be a, a superior course for our kids in preparation for, for college, obviously, and for, for further AP classes in, in uh, history. Great, um, that, I, that's, that sounds like a, a real enhancement. On the AP bio, how does that, connect in with the JCC biology offering because now we have our Regents biology, we have the JCC which actually gets college credit and now we have the AP bio. So there's, you know, I, I appreciate there's different content and, and those types of things, but are you going to be competing for the same kids in that JCC bio versus the, the AP? bio we're not actually the the ap the ap bio is going to be taking the place of the jcc uh, bio course and the reason for that is uh, they've changed the requirements for the jcc course and many of our kids were unable to get college credit for it any longer so uh, essentially that that was almost a non-option for our kids for this coming school year so we thought this was the perfect year to put this in so that our kids would be able to get college credit still and uh, pursue uh, biology that, that relates to the medical field. So the JCC bio is going away as well? Yes. There, we, we did bring back another uh, elective that was already on the book, so they didn't need to do a course proposal for it, and that's environmental science. And so taking the place of, of that, uh, that JC, JCC class, it's not a JCC course, uh, but, it, but it is an environmental science class and, and it is uh, something that we've had quite a, quite a few number or a good number of kids sign up for. So I, I just want to understand because I know there's been discussion in the community about increasing the number of JCC classes that we offer and now we're taking one away. Um, so, so what I, I do just want to understand what changed in the requirements on the JCC side that that our kids weren't able to to meet that expectation anymore? Um, part of it is the the English requirement, and and so I'm going to balance this your your question with a, I hope a positive answer. We are going to add a, a JCC English class to a class that we already offer, and again, it's not a new course; it's our journalism course. And uh, we were able to work with JCC and they're going to allow us to give the, the English credit for that course um, that we are already teaching. And that in turn, in future years, will open up doors for other courses that, uh, that require that English credit in order to get uh, the JCC credit. That, that was a gateway course that we have never been able to get to offer. And finally this year, after working with the English department, and uh, Mrs. Reinhardt, who's going to be teaching it, uh, we're, we're able to offer that class. So I would say this is a hiatus uh, for one year. And now that we are offering this course, it could open the door for many more courses that we weren't able to offer for college credit. But they did change the, the requirements for the, the bio course at JCC, and they had to have this English prior to, to getting credit or getting a very, very high score on this test called the AccuPlacer, and very few kids were able to do that. Okay. 
Okay, I, I appreciate you explaining that a little bit more, Mr. Paschke. Thank you. Excuse me, I, I want to jump in and just point yep. something out that Darren said that connects with something that, that John said during the budget presentation. And, and I've shared this with the board uh, before, um, but the ability to purchase textbooks that are needed for these AP courses th in this year's budget is significant. And it's significant for a number of reasons. Number one, it's a positive impact on, on the budget you're going to discuss further in a few minutes. But the other part too, and you heard John say this about a number of, of items is there, they're the use it or, or lose it variety. So if you're not using your textbook aid, subsequent years, your, your textbook aid gets reduced. If you're not using your software aid in subsequent years, your, your software aid gets, get, gets reduced. Now, on a, as a common sense approach to a as a taxpayer, it should be spend what you need. Don't find ways to spend money so you have the same amount in, in, in future years. But that's not the system that we're in. Um, the benefit here is that we have, we have a real need and as you can imagine, AP bio textbooks are very expensive and the AP uh, um, uh, world history books aren't exactly cheap either. So because of, uh, of some frugalness throughout our district, we're able to expense those this year and to, to the benefit of a number of students, including those who will benefit from, from the additional textbook funds we're not expending next year. This is a really good opportunity all around uh, and before I go any further, I want to thank uh, Mrs. Piper for taking the lead. One of her tasks and, and district level responsibilities was to research how other districts onboard new courses, what's required of them, what goes into it. Uh, and as Mr. Paschke clearly pointed out, it should be and can be and is extensive. And when you do that, you have a product that you get buy-in, not only from the, from the staff who did the work, but also from the students that enrollment in those courses is really significant. And it's important for you to understand that students enrolled in those courses with a full understanding that they may not be offered, okay? Mr. Paschke and I worked with the guidance team and we had some discussions and they, they were very clear that you can sign up for AP World History or AP Bio or the, or the topic with the understanding that we're not sure that, that we are gonna move forward with those courses at this time. Um, but, and I know Mrs. Fortner, you're, you're, you're big on this, the demand was there, right? And the demand was there. I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Roman said very unequivocally, there, any student that's interested in the medical field, they need AP Bio. There's no question about that. So um, I'm very appreciative of Ms. Piper's work and Mr. Paschke's work, as well as those teachers who did something they've never had to do before in their time in Fredonia. And they really tackled a, a difficult task uh, at a very high level. Thank you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Piper and Mr. Paskey. Um, we next have minutes from the regular meeting of May 12, 2020. Can I get a motion from the board to bring that to the floor, please? Ms. Gaggenshots in a second. Mr. Forrester, uh, any questions, comments, corrections? If not, all those in favor of accepting the, the minutes, uh, please signify by raising your hand. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have the financial treasurer's report with some change orders. Um, you know, Mr. Forrester, I'm going to take your recommendation from a couple uh, meetings ago, and we're going to take these all at once. Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> if I could get a motion to, to bring all of these uh, to the floor at once, we can discuss them all and then vote on them all at the same time. Ms. Gaggenschatz, thank you. In a second. Ms. Fortna, Ms. Powell Fortna, uh, any questions or comments? Mr. Certicio, explanation? Sure, sure. So e each one of these change orders reflects uh, uh, additional work um, that has been discussed ad nauseum um, through numerous meetings at, and with the facilities committee. Um, because we are so under budget, any, any work that we do going forward will 
uh, be part of a change order. Uh, to give you a brief rundown, um, you know that we made significant changes to the uh, middle school student services suite to make it a true suite. That obviously incurred some costs. Uh, we needed a place for the AED and uh, after the nurses uh, renovations were complete. And um, you know, those are really the types of costs. So you'll see an increase uh, for the replace of the floor in B-153. That is the life skills room. Um, that cost is, uh, is encompassed in the total cost for that room, which we've discussed before. Uh, there are some increased costs for that room because we had to do some unexpected abatement. Uh, window shades uh, were for the high school student services suite and district office. District office still has not received their window shades, but high school student services has. I think they're trying to, to mess with me a little bit, but that's okay. Um, and then we talked about it, adding some canopies to the, to the ball fields at both uh, the Main Street campus and the Wheelock campus. So none of these costs are a surprise. Um, and they're all in, in part of the addition, uh, additional scope of the project. Thank you. Do we have any questions on any of these? No. Um, then uh, all those in favor of approving all three of these, please signify by raising your hand. Thank you very much. Uh, we next have the approval of the proposed budget for the 2021 school year. Can I get a motion to bring that to the floor for discussion, please? Ms. Powell Fortna and a second by Mr. Hawk. Um, I will, uh, we, have, we have had the presentation. Uh, Comments and questions. <clears throat> Mr. Hawk. Uh, I, I've got a question for John Forbes in regards to the uh, fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, looking at our external auditors uh, reports, I find that um, <clears throat> it's very helpful for me as John showed, looking at the TRS history, historical uh, numbers compared to current and present numbers. So just looking back five years, John, um, you know, to the report from the external auditors, we had on page 24, a fund balance total um, in the general ledger now of 3,718,000. Five years later, which is our 2019 um, external uh, budget, we showed a $6,070,000 uh, fund balance. That's a, that's a growth of about $2,350,000. Um, approximately $470,000 a year, our fund balance grew or using a percentage, it's 12 and a half percent. In five years, that's what our fund balance grew. Um, how much of our fund balance currently, and, and what I'm looking at is your information <laughs> pamphlet that you gave us. Um, it, it's marked, it, look, it appears like 01-2 page. Um, it says 2018-2019 unappropriated fund balance, 3,544,000. Total fund balance, 454,000. How much of that is cash? And how much of it is in uh, reserves? You're muted, John. That better? All right. Um, the multiple level question there, Mr. Hawk, because you got, you got a couple of different parts of that. In the $6 million number, likely is included the re reserves. Um, and in those reserves, we've got you know, 500,000 as a tax certiorari. We've got 122,000 for 
the ERS benefits, we've got 66,000 for unemployment, we've got 150,000 remaining in our capital, which at the time of the report would have been uh, 500,000 because we hadn't pulled out the 350 that we applied against the project yet. And then 400,000 of retirement contributions. So those are added to any of your unassigned uh, amounts. And I'm sorry, your question was about cash, correct? Yes. Yeah, I would have to pull that together off the top of my head. I, I'd be guessing if I gave you a number. Um, I'd probably have it. It would take me a minute to find it. But Okay, well, because as I was pointing out in our last conversation from your budget summary, I was reviewing what we had for revenues compared to your budget. And again, looking at the external auditor's report, when they compared our budget um, revenues compared to the uh, expenditure we had and, and the end of June 30th, 2019, $284,000 to the plus side. So that means when we closed out, when we cashed out our year, we, we came out with $284,500. So um, it just goes to seeing that we have the numbers inflated in the budget. That leads me to a question about this budget. And I'm really being honest when I ask this question, how much do we still have inflated in our budget over revenues? I, I'll be happy to answer that question. Uh, let me explain how this works as part of the answer though. In each budget year, you need to, which I'm sure you do even for your own business, uh, you use an amount that you think is going to happen if all things are equal, no surprises up or down. And what I do and have done, and this was even substantiated by the New York State Controller's Audit, is most of the adjustments of that sort that I have, I carry on the expenditure side, mostly because there's not a lot of wiggle room, if you will, on the revenue side. 50% of your money comes from the state. There's not really much you can put on top of that because it's a given number. You know what your tax levy is. That's another 43 or 44%. So really, if I was going to say, I think it's going to be $100,000, but I need to hedge that a little bit, I'll put 150. Where am I really going to put it on the revenue side? Because there's not a lot of choice. On the expenditure side, which the controller's report also showed, and I think you recall the, the language was that uh, they used something of that I overestimated expenses or something of that nature. And basically what I'm doing there is again, looking at each line item and saying, what I think is going to happen here if all things stay equal. And actually this, this was brought up uh, in discussion today. So an example of that would be, let's take the health insurance line. And the health insurance line, what I do, and, and uh, Kim assisted me with it this year to verify my number, is I go through and I take everybody who's on the books right now, what policies they have, what the price of those are, and I have a number. And then on top of that, I have to say, what are the chances that a couple people get married and have, who now have single plans? What are the chances that somebody gets divorced and goes to a single plan? What are the chances that a new employee coming in because of the age 26 requirements doesn't need insurance now? What are the chances that one of the ones we hired last year who turns 26 needs insurance? And on top of my base number, I then have to put a number. So in this particular budget proposal, that number was $100,000. Part of that is built in as what I would say, I have, I have two categories. I have what I believe is known fund balance and I have what I hope to be fund balance. So using health insurance as the continued example of that 100,000, I might have, if nobody gets married, nobody has kids, nobody needs additional insurance, I'll have 100,000. But it might turn out that I only have 10 or 12 or 15 or 40. And so that's how, when you go through each line item, that's how I'm looking at it. I'm saying, what do I really need? Utilities is another great example. You take a look at what your historical pattern is. I know that that's one of the lines I typically carry extra in, but how much extra do I carry? And at the end of the day, when you total all those up to answer your question in short, uh, I've got about 750,000 in coming back in, which is noted on this last slide to go against the 1.1 that we're now applying. So a net decrease of approximately 450 or 500,000 at the end of the year, if all things are equal. And how do, how do we end up with a $284,000 um, plus? Well, very easily. Uh, one, the budget process that was used and was encouraged by the board for this year 
was not the process that I was using in the past. Um, going back before Mr. Certicio and Mr. Defonso was there, there was a movement at the time because we had a really low fund balance to improve our fund balance. So through the various things that you can do as part of the process, we intentionally uh, built in line items to try to improve our fund balance if everything came in exactly as we planned. And that was done. For the 1819 year, which is the year you're referring to, that was done following the same philosophy. So my expectation would be at the end of 1920 that we should see the slide down that the board has asked for and that we're anticipating. And that's the way we build 2021. And, and give me a, an explanation to what we're going to see in unused money because the schools have been closed. Well, you had a couple of slides the last couple of presentations that showed uh, some of the areas that we know were below. Um, I can tell you exactly those in a second here. Um, we do have hanging out there, obviously, the big question on transportation because that's about $100,000 a month as an expense. We also would not be getting the 72 or 73 percent back aid against it. So that becomes a pretty good flux there. Uh, this, this is opening up slowly, so just give me one second. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are areas that uh, obviously we're not spending. Spring sports is an example. Uh, the coaching salaries, we're not spending the bulk of those because the season didn't take place. But on the other hand, a lot of the supplies were purchased in anticipation of that sport. So those don't really affect us. Um, and I opened up the wrong one, so forgive me one more second here. Well, Mr. Forbes, I can fill in some of the gaps while you're looking for the exact numbers. Um, we had some significant unexpected costs this year in, in terms of the number of high cost special needs students that moved into the district or, or needed services that, um, that we were unaware of or unable to <clears throat> provide. Um, the, the offset of, of the pandemic uh, pause really uh, has been eliminated by those high costs. Um, and, and while Mr. Forbes said we're not um, paying the bulk of coaches' salaries, we did come to an agreement with, uh, with the FTA that we, were, we are going to pay one-fifth of those coaches' salaries because they did start, most of them did start part of their season. So it's not a full, uh, full recovery of those salaries. And that's pretty similar to what other districts are doing as well. Did I talk long enough for you to open that, John? Yes, you did. Thank you. I, I put letters by each one when I make the changes and I kept opening the wrong ones. But uh, to go back to Mr. Hawk's questions, things that we know we're gonna spend less for, as an example, are substitute teacher salaries because we haven't had any since the middle of March. So we're looking at somewhere around 40 to $50,000 there. Uh, Fuel transportation, that should also be down because we had obviously no buses running for a couple months. I would think we'd probably be in the fifteen dollars to $20,000 range there. You're looking at approximately 60000 from spring sports, about thirty four dollars or 35000 from the instructional side of materials and field trips and things of those nature that were not used. Um, as I mentioned, the transportation. On the flip side of it, as Mr. Tertissio mentioned, we had the influx of the five positions, uh, five student positions for high cost BOCE special ed, which was a net out of pocket unexpected of 430,000. We also had the addition of the PTEC students to a tune of about 40,000. And we had a real property tax refund to about 22,000. So, but some of those things are offset in the normal course of doing business. The specifics of what you think is gonna be unspent because of the pandemic, those we go back to the substitute teacher salaries and things of that nature. The union contracts, uh, health insurance and so forth, those are all contractual obligations. So there hasn't been a decrease there at this point. Okay. Let's not forget too that FTA's willingness in, uh, to extend their contract by, by a year is a savings of probably a hundred some thousand dollars uh, and what we anticipated would, would have cost the district in terms of uh, new money. So that's, that's a pretty significant savings that's already baked into the budget proposal. Right, and the other piece of that, which would be for board's information, because I don't think we've discussed this at all, uh, because the FTA did a one-year extension that now brings their contract back up in 2021. Also, the salaried support staff group, which is our custodial maintenance, building secretaries, nurses, uh, some of our library and tech staff, they will also be up. Their contract, much like the CSEA contract last year, will have impact to some of the lower level people in the contract based upon minimum wage. 
So there's going to be a, a financial factor there, even if you were to do nothing else on top of that. So. <clears throat> so then I got one final question for Mr. Certicio. Uh, could you give me a little insight as to discussions you've had with other superintendents in regards to if the state does a pullback as to what we see our school districts doing to work collaboratively to uh, get through any state aid reductions? You, Mr. Rock, do you mean collaboratively in terms of uh, partnering for programs and athletics and extracurriculars, those type of types of things? Or you mean in terms of lobbying um, for aid? What are you looking at there? Well, I would say uh, all. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, you're aware that we have good partnerships and, and there are a number of, uh, a number of athletic teams that, um, that we already in, in are in agreement with other, other districts. Um, we do do, we, this, this year in particular, and it will probably continue and expand, we have in, increased our uh, shared transportation, particularly to events and, and, and also for some of those students that are uh, attending programs in outlying areas. That's absolutely going to increase. And that was a change to the law a year ago that allowed what they essentially call piggybacking. Prior to that change in law, uh, each district had to bus their own children wherever they were going. So if Casadega had a bus coming by Fredonia and they were heading down to, I don't know, wherever, um, and we were going to the same place, we each had to send an individual child on a bus where now we're able to, to share those costs. So there has been talk about it in increasing those opportunities. Um, I certainly would expect that if districts are in a situation where extracurriculars um, are, are being cut, that we would examine the opportunity to partner with, with other districts in similar fashion to what we do with athletics. Um, I don't know if that's a possibility. I don't know if it's ever been done, um, but it's certainly something that we would have to look at uh, in order to make sure students still have those extended opportunities. Uh, I can tell you there's a lot of talk um, across the state about how to use what we're learning in, the, in, this, in this pause. Um, and what I mean about learning in terms of the use of electronic devices to, to enhance uh, student learning and whether there's opportunity for students to participate in programs that, that are only offered at other schools. That's a big lift and it re would require a partnership with, with multiple teachers unions. Um, I can tell you that it, it would only happen if both sides agree there wouldn't be a loss of jobs. There's no way the FTA is going to agree to, to remote learning or distance learning if it meant it was going to cost some of their members, members' positions. So in terms of that, on the saving side, the savings discussions have really been about student programs and, and opportunities and how we could work together. Um, and that's really, that's really the best that we can do uh, unless you want to go into a deeper discussion uh, and, and push the envelope on, on what it would mean for, for districts to merge. That's certainly more that we can, we can tackle this evening. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Well, we have a uh, we have a proposed budget with a one and a half percent tax increase, um, and we're, we're kind of filling in the blanks here as we go along, uh, just because we did not have that one that agenda was uh, proposed and it's kind of hot off the press. Um, any questions, concerns, comments from the board on on that one and a half percent? Ryan? Mr. Yeah, Mr. Forster. So um, I first of all I do appreciate the fact that a lot of um, of the reductions were made so that this budget could come out um, at the 1.5%. Um, Mark, uh, definitely appreciate that 100%. When I look at what we were looking for in regards to 
the percentage of unassigned fund balance. And we were looking around those seven to 9%, you know, range. Um, I, 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 I wanted to wait until you guys came out with, you know, these, this number to kind of look to see where we're at. And um, I, I personally feel that uh, if we look at a 1%, uh, that kind of puts us in a good spot for uh, having an 8% fund balance and also not increasing um, the percentage from 0% to 1.5%, but from 0% to 1%. So um, I personally feel that that uh, is an appropriate uh, percentage increase to 1%. Uh, so those are my thoughts. So just to, just to clarify, uh, uh, Mr. Forster, your, your comment is that you'd like uh, the tax levy to be reduced by 0.5%, and your recommendation in, in order to make up that 0.5% is to utilize more fund balance, which is essentially about $80,000. Uh, that'd be correct. Okay. You're not looking for additional cuts. It's make up that point five. You're not you're not asking right. for a combination of cuts and fund balance. You're saying <clears throat> absolutely. I think I feel that we could use the. I feel like we can get to there through the fund balance. Not not. I think that personally, looking at what was cut and everything that was reduced, um, I, I feel that we've done in that area as much as you could do in, in that regard. I think that. But what we can do though is we can look at maybe applying more fund balance to get that to an eight percent uh, fund balance. Again, this is an estimate for next year. But do a one percent increase instead of one point five. Okay. Other thoughts from the board. <clears throat> John, what might that equate to uh, the increase per home is the example you used earlier at fifty dollars? Uh, give me one second and I can answer that for you. Uh, roughly $34 on an average home in the town of Pompey. So I guess, um, you know, just thinking about that, we're talking about about a $16 difference between the 1% and the 1.5 on that average. Um, I guess what I would say is, is I, I, we are in a, in a tough balance here. I definitely have concerns about the tail and what's going to happen in the next two to three years and making sure that we don't deplete that fund balance um, too extensively this year as we could have you know greater need in in upcoming years um, I, I think we need to recognize that that our school has been kind of an anchor of services and stability in the community through this crisis right now providing meals and technology and things like that and I guess I'm concerned that if we, if we put at risk some of our financial position, that we won't be able to continue to be that stability um, and that foundation in future years as we see how this plays out. There's so many unknowns um, and risks. So I would just put that out there as we, as we think about that one to one and a half percent um, and the real impact versus the service that we really provide to, to the community. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ock. Hearing um, the, the dollar value of 1%, um, I think what it equates to is $160,000. 130. So um, when you, when you have I'm, I'm going to just roughly say $3.2 million in cash. That equates to answering Lisa's question of about 20 years and a lot of correction to 
efficiencies and a lot of corrections to um, working with other districts could then take place. Um, I definitely understand everybody's point. Uh, I have personally dealt with the pandemic um, cut uh, in my household by not working for a great amount of time. Uh, it, uh, there's a lot of people that I know that are not working um, and, and have not had incomes. We are looking at reserves that were put aside for this type of occasion. This is, this is unprecedented. This is, this is a situation to where nobody could have ever predicted it. And the magnitude of cost to people outside of our school district in the private sector is incredibly high. And I think any increase, to my opinion, is an insult to injury. And in this time, we most definitely can afford reviewing our fund balance, that small $160,000 reduction. I am in favor of 0%. Just a point of information, uh, 240,000 would be zero uh, that you'd have to take off the levy. But Even the 240 when you've got <laughs> over 3 million in cash is a fair trade. And that's not saying that next year we can't reapproach this. And once everything is realigned and we find out exactly how it is that we, we end up, as you say, Lisa, the tail. And, and I completely understand our school district, I learned this a long time ago, is a community center. This is, this is where everybody goes to for adult services, adult education, extracurricular activities. This is the biggest non-dimensional, I mean, there's just bar none the school district in every community is the most important, I think, uh, piece. And the 240,000, uh, John, I, I think we can, we can see our way through that. So I think you know how I will be voting. Ms. Gagenstaff, your thoughts. Um, yeah, I am, I'm not on the same page as Mr. Hawk. I totally appreciate, um, what you're saying, Tom. I, um, really, I do. I'm just so concerned about next year and the year after. I'm concerned about the clawback from the state. I'm, I'm not convinced we're going to get much relief from the federal government. Um, I, I just can't, I, I just don't think it's responsible of us to, to go to zero. Um, I appreciate Lisa's comments and, and he's so, I think I could get behind the 1%. Um, and using the additional funds from the reserve. I think that seems reasonable and still leaves us with um, money for next year, you know, for just things we just, we just can't predict, you know, what kind of a position we're gonna be in next year or even in the middle of the year. Um, so, <clears throat> I am. Thank you. Mr. Johnston, I haven't heard from you. Well, Mr. Alders, I'm probably going to repeat myself a little bit from last week. Um, but, you know, this is a diff difficult balancing act. Uh, in my first year, um, you know, we, 
you have the uh, the tax base side, you have the educational side, you have the crystal ball of the future side, which nobody knows. Um, and you know we've we pared down we we pared down another two hundred sixty five thousand dollars tonight on the expenditure side. I'm with Mr. Forrester. I think we've we've pared down. I think you know this comes down with me personally to a, a now a, a fund balance uh, tax increase sort of debate. I think that's what we're all talking about, or we have talked about those that have spoken. Uh, you know. Considering that we're at zero zero percent tax last year, and considering that it look it's bad this year, it's bad. But I really fear, and I echo some of the others that have spoken, your thoughts that it's going to get worse. We could lose one hundred sixty five thousand mid year. We could have teacher retirement increases next year. Uh, we don't know what the state aid will be next year. Uh, I, I worry about preserving or, you know, keeping our fund balance healthy enough that we can use it again next year, not robbing it all, all this year. So I come out to, I, I, I'm in agreement with several of you around 1%. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Zambron. <clears throat> I know you had weighed in earlier, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get you uh, to commit to a number here as far as a percent. Okay. <clears throat> well, everyone, everyone has made some very good points, and I agree with everyone. <clears throat> but and, and I really want to thank Mr. Certicio and Mr. Forbes for once again being very creative uh, in their financing and trying to get this down. Try, um, they still feel that and this is a crisis situation and it would be in good faith to our community. And I know I mentioned the last meeting we had 1%, but I, I, if we could, I would like to see us go to a 0% again this year. And knowing full fully what what's been presented to us about the possibilities of what may happen in the future. Thank you, Mr. Jane Brown. Um, I appreciate the commitment from from everyone as far as your 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 uh, your thoughts on a, a percentage here. Um, if I could, if I could summarize uh, for everyone, and this isn't just as of tonight. This is um, this is through conversations that I've had with with uh, people in the, in the public. It's been through meetings around here. Um, I, I think that we're looking at uh, state funding. That um, I, I if. You don't believe that state funding will get cut either mid-year or significantly next year. Um, I think you're sadly mistaken. Um, I look at where our unemployment is and they're talking about a peak of 25% um, and that's an average of 25%. But that includes uh, a labor force that could go as high as 40% of, of laborers, uh, waitresses, uh, people who work for an hourly wage, um, really is what I see as a di dichotomy. Those people that um, have been affected severely by this pandemic, um, and those people who have not. And as I said last week, uh, I have been very fortunate in that our, in, you know, our household income has not been affected by this. But I think that we have to uh, be very cognizant of those people uh, whose household income has been affected severely. Um, and it's those people at the lower, lower levels of income that have been affected the most. 
Um, we know that there's going to be increased expenses with TRS, ERS, the employment, you know, uh, re retirement and teachers retirement, um, not only in the, the next year, but several years to come. Uh, we look at, um, we look at what the state had done to us with the gap elimination and the potential for future future clawbacks, um, it, it's, it's very concerning uh, to, to run a district. And uh, Mr. Forbes, if you think that, that this was tough, uh, I will almost guarantee you that next year will be just as bad or worse. So uh, it, it won't get easier. <clears throat> but we also have students that we have to be very concerned of. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, students who have had distance learning for for what I'm going to say is 14 weeks uh, with limited new material, and I'm concerned about where they're going to be next year uh, when they come back. And uh, historically, they've uh, they're coming into the year with the expectations that they had the full year before that with with uh, the, the full course offering. And, and I'm concerned that there's been some things that uh, without the new material that, that they may be lacking. And uh, there's gonna be some catch up there on, on the instructional side. There's, there's definitely, you know, Mr. Johnson had mentioned that some of these students are, are gonna have some social issues uh, because of this pandemic and some of the things that have occurred, not only uh, by not being in school, but uh, some of the issues that this pandemic has caused um, outside of, of the, the school system. Uh, we have no idea what our restrictions are going to be for next year. Uh, we have no idea what course size, class size is going to be. Uh, we have no idea if there's going to be unfunded mandates that that will take our expenses uh, considerably higher uh, because of, again, unfunded, unfunded mandates from the state. Um, we do provide a, a necessary service. We are a, a community center. Uh, that that we can't allow to to just dwindle away. Uh, this is this is something that uh, you know we hold strong and dear. <clears throat> we kind we have to get ahead of this curve here somehow. Um, and whatever we decide tonight, as far as a percentage, um, I do believe that that we are going to have to have contingencies for the coming year uh, as far as potential cuts, uh, depending on where the state comes in with their funding, uh, and then look at where what we're going to do for next year if, if those states are even greater. So we're going to have to have uh, some contingency plans, not only mid-year, but next year. <clears throat> um, lastly, we have to put out a budget that uh, this isn't the end of it. Uh, it has to be approved by our voters. And if we come up with something that, that is unrealistic uh, and is an insult to certain people, uh, I'm afraid that some of those people uh, at the, who have been severely affected economically by this won't vote for a budget that, that sees too much of an increase. Um, if we look at where everybody is on this board, uh, you know, we're going from 0% to 1.5%. And uh, you know several at one percent. Um, 
<coughs> I'm going to propose a, um, a three quarter increase in tax. Um, and you know, this is this is a compromise. Uh, it, it's not going to give anybody mm -hmm. on this board what they want. Nobody has wanted the 75 or 0.75% increase. Um, so nobody's getting what they want, but everybody's getting a little bit of what they want. And I will, uh, uh, I will ask if, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of who provided the motion here for this. Ms. Slagle, who provided the motion? Do you know who provided the motion? And so, I don't believe. <clears throat> I don't believe we've had a motion yet, Mr. Aldrich. Yeah. Really? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it was uh, Mrs. Ford and I, Mr. Hawk. Sorry about that. Thank you. That's that's who. My memory is better than what I thought because that's what I had uh, thought, but I didn't you know. I, I don't want to rely on that anymore. Um, I am going to ask, um, and, and this isn't a requirement, but I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Paul Fortna and Mr. Hawk if they would care to adjust their motion. Brian or Christine, uh, is Lisa the one that's supposed to and I would second? Correct. All right, so. So the request is to uh, have a motion to reduce from the 1.5 to the 0.75. That is correct. And, and have the adjustment made within the fund balance. <clears throat> That's a, that's a tough motion. Um, Mr. Aldrich, I believe that the, the motion to bring that to discussion wouldn't need to be modified. Um, you know, you could make an additional motion uh, beyond that to bring a different number to the table and that would have to be seconded. Even yeah. though we've got a, a motion and a second on the table right now. Yeah, and, there, and the motion and, and, and the second on the table right now are to approve the, the amount of the budget, okay? Um, it is not, as I, read the, uh, as I read the agenda, it's not specific in, ter in terms of what the, uh, what the tax levy would be. But what I'm hearing is a discussion about, there's an agreement of a $30,666,526 budget and someone correct me if I'm wrong on that number. And then the discussion was how to get to that number with less of an impact on, uh, on the taxpayers. So, so what you're, you're uh, indicating, Mr. Certicio, is that uh, B1 is a dollar amount of, of the budget, and then C, one through five, provides the tax rate and the amount of, um, uh, of, of, I'm, I'm gonna, pulling out of reserves basically. Yeah, Is that so, so what, and this goes back to my, my comment to Mr. Forster. Um, I, I, and that's why I specifically asked, is this board looking for additional cuts? I've heard really from all board members um, that, that is not what you're looking for. Although some did not say that explicitly, um, I did ask that question and I assume that would have been comments back if the, if the board was looking for additional cuts. So under B1, you are first agreeing to the total budget amount. And then as you just pointed out, uh, if the board agrees to that, we move forward with, for, with discussion about how we're gonna get to that amount. 
And that's where your 0.75, I think, would, would, would come into play. Go ahead, Mr. Hawk. So I, I, I guess my understanding was additional cuts weren't on the table. We were just discussing this. So we are able to ask you to make additional cuts and possibly the difference from 0.75, what Brian is uh, proposing, and the 1.5 that's being um, offered. You can, and Mr. Forbes and I can take a pause and try and find some more cuts to make. Um, but I'm going to go back to, to what I said in the beginning of this discussion is I anticipate that um, at the very least, we're going to lose $165,000 out of that pandemic adjustment. And we may more likely than not will need to make adjustments uh, to expenditures as we move forward. It's, it's, the, it's the, the very nature of the incredibly difficult position the board is in not having insurances of state aid today and still mm -hmm. need to, needing to settle on a budget. So I appreciate your comments, uh, Mr. Hawk and, and everyone mm -hmm. else's comments. Um, and I, I caution you again, if you go too low, you leave the district no options going forward in the short term, meaning heading into next school year. And as Mr. Aldridge pointed out, we don't know what we're gonna face and we don't know what unfunded mandates we're gonna face just to share a couple of, of fears. What if we have to run mul multiple sections of school throughout the day? And we have to have multiple sections of, of, uh, of elementary coming in throughout the day. That's increased bus runs. That's increased lunch runs. Um, what do we do about social distancing our high school? Do we run an AM and a PM program? You know, if, that, if that extends our, our, uh, the contractual day for our employees, how are we gonna make up those costs? Um, at unprecedented times for sure. The gap elimination we knew was because of a financial crisis. And we've seen our country come back from financial crises, okay? This is a financial crisis on the back of a, uh, of a health crisis that, that may dissipate, may come back again, and, and furiously so. So if you go too low, then you leave those that, that have to make cuts, no, no choice but to, but to start digging deep. And we haven't had to do that yet. Right? So I caution you to leave yourself a buffer. And I recognize the amount of fund balance in terms of dollars and cents is a big amount. But in a $30 million budget, if you start spending a million, a million and a half, two million, three million dollars a year in fund balance, um, you, you pretty soon aren't going to have anything to rely on. And in the biggest component of your budget, unlike a private business, the biggest component of your budget is personnel. We got over 80%, over I'm sure, in terms of, of salary and benefits. And if we're really going to make changes to the budget, you all know that's where it has to come from. There's only so much in supplies we can cut. There's only so much equipment we can cut. No one has the stomach to take away all kinds of extracurriculars, music, art, and sports. Okay? So I'll just caution you again about, about going too low. Mr. Alger, if I may briefly, uh, just for a point of information for the board, if you were to make any adjustment off the 1.5% and specifically take that from fund balance, your total spending plan that Mr. Sertisio gave you a second ago does not change. It only changes the distribution between fund balance revenue and tax levy. If you were to do anything outside of that, looking at additional expenditure lines, then we would definitely need a pause to figure out what that's gonna be and rerun everything because it's a it kind of works through all my spreadsheets. It's uh, fund balance is a one line entry, expenditures is multi line. So, just a point of information there. And I would be remiss as the business administrator if I didn't express my concern with going to zero again. I understand all the reasons why. I don't disagree with any of the arguments you had. It's my responsibility to treat the funds of the district as though my own, they were my own and to manage them as carefully as possible, which is what I think I've done. So, I just have to get that on the books that I would be. A little more uncomfortable than maybe I normally would be. Um, forward. I would just, you know, based on that conversation, like to hold my motion to accept the the budget total as it's presented, and then move to figuring out how we how we 
get to that dollar. <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm seeing a, a question in my thought process. Would we be able to lower that one and a half percent that you are uh, proposing, John and Jeff? In the next motion, right? Correct. All right, because uh, what what I uh, did is understood that what we were doing was bringing it up to a roll call vote as to general discussion and changes at that point could take place from what was proposed because it is only proposed. It's not in fact voted on. So we are, we are amending if we were to drop to 0.75 as to the motion. So Lisa, you being that you made the motion and I second it would have to do that. <laughs> Just for the budget number. Yeah, so my motion is for the total budget number. Right? All right, so that if I can add some clarification again, then if you approve the budget number as it stands right now, which is a 1.19% spending plan, that then becomes your number moving into the next motion. Therefore, if you approve the spending plan as it is now, you're, that, you're locked in there. The only difference would be then your ability to massage fund balance right. versus the tax levy. You would not have the option in the second motion to reduce expenses because you've already approved a total spending plan. Correct. Right. I guess that's where Mr. Hawk was going to with it. Right, and that's where I was wanting to maintain the current motion on the table for the for the spending plan, and then adjust if needed in the next motion. So, so we we have the uh, the proposal out there for the spending plan that will be uh, would be voted on. Then, then in the next section, section C, uh, and, and that's the property tax report card, it, at that time, we would be looking at, are we going to pull money from the reserve? Correct. What you would have is in the second motion under C. Is everyone C, clear? C1 and 2 would be locked in based mm -hmm. upon your motion at B because you would have a total spending plan and a total spending increase. What you'd be talking about in C would be whether you're going to do anything with three or four. Yeah. Right. Actually four because your levy won't change either as how you're funding it. Right. Let me ask this specific question so that I understand a little clearer. We are at 1.9% now with the proposed budget. 1.19. 1.19? Spending, yes. So, and we have people that are proposing 1.5? No. 1.19 is the spending plan. Your tax levy is 1.5%. It's a distribution of how the revenue is there, but you're. Okay. So I'm talking about the tax levy. Right. Tax levy is 1.5% currently. Okay. Currently. Yeah. And this is the motion that's on the table. No. No. The motion, no. no. All right. the motion on the table is for the 30 million, whatever the number is. Thirty million six hundred sixty thousand dollars and five or, or 66,526. So will we have the option to reduce the percentage to the tax levy in the next motion? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so are we all clear then? Let me make sure. Yeah, let me make sure. What you're voting on now is is the up to spending plan. Yeah. Okay? 
And, and the expenses have increased by 1.19%. If you vote in favor of the $30,666,526, that is the most amount that the district uh, can expend in that year. And again, I say that's an up to amount. It's a maximum amount. Um, as we've already discussed, if all things happen perfectly, we'll spend, the district will spend less than that, okay? This has nothing to do with the tax levy, only the, uh, the total amount of money that, that could be expended next, next school year, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so if we are all clear, uh, if I could have a vote by the board members uh, to approve the motion to, to take the uh, proposed 2020, 2021 budget of $30,666,526, which is an increase of spending of 1.19%. Just one minor correction, Mr. Aldridge. Let's call it thirty million six hundred sixty-six thousand five hundred twenty-six dollars. Because if thirty thousand is not going to cut it, <laughs> thirty million six hundred sixty-six thousand five twenty-six. You know, I should know numbers better than that. Sorry. Uh, all board members in favor of that, please signify by. This is a oh, Mr. Aldridge. This is a roll call vote. Yes. Okay, I'll begin the roll call if everyone Ms. is ready. Portugal. Yes. Okay, Mr. Aldrich? Yes. Mr. Forster? Yes. Mrs. Fortna? Yes. Ms. Gegenschatz? Yes. Mr. Jambron? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Hawk? Yes. And Mr. Johnston? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, you know, I, I appreciate everyone's help. And that, that's not just the board, that is uh, Mr. Certicio, Mr. Forbes, all of the administration who has helped to put this together because it's, uh, there, there are so many pieces. I appreciate everyone's work. Um, we next have uh, an approval of the uh, district property tax report card for the 2021 proposed budget. Now, Mr. Forbes, um, I'm assuming that you are going to have to, um, well, are you, are you going to need anything other than uh, the 0.75 tax levy increase? Do you need to do any calculations? Uh, no. Um, what would happen is if you go to the, the 0.75, then it will reduce the amount on line three, and it will change the percentage that's currently proposed of 1.5 on line four. Uh, so I guess the board would need to decide if they're going to reduce that, and if it's going to be using fund balance to do so, in which case I can do <laughs> those numbers readily. So this is the point um, where you would discuss what what uh, tax levy percentage you're, you uh, want to put forth to the voters. And a lot of that discussion has taken place, um, but I, I, as it was left, it, it's, I, I felt there was probably some more discussion that needed to be had. But okay. it's your meeting, not mine. So, so um, I am going to need a motion to uh, to bring to the table the uh, approval of the school district property tax report card. And uh, uh, I'm going to suggest that that motion be with a property tax levy increase of 0.75. And uh, Mr. Forbes will need to provide the numbers for us uh, as we go go through this, but I need a motion to bring this to the floor, at least for discussion. Mr. Hawk, and can I get a second on that? Uh, 
Mr. Jim Brown. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, the, the motion on the table, Mr. Forbes, is for a tax levy increase of 0.75%. Um, the estimated school budget is $30,666,520. The percent spending increase will be the 1.19. The estimated school tax levy will be, and you, you will need to calculate that. You want me to do that for the one, the 0.75, correct? For the 0.75, yes. Right. 16,179,802. Okay. The percentage increase to the tax levy is 0.75. Uh, and the projected K-12 enrollment is, for the coming year, is 1,509 students. That is the motion that is before us. Ms. and, and comments, Mrs. Ms. Paul Forna. Uh, Mr. Forbes, could you tell us now then what is the amount that would be coming out of the fund balance to make up that difference? Uh, it would be an additional 120,442. So sorry, can you give the total, like now the total amount that's coming out? 1,220,442. And what does that drop our percentage of that reserve to? Um, using the, the data that we showed in the presentation, you'd be looking at uh, nine. Probably uh, somewhere between 7.8 and 8% if all things came in projected. Ms. Powell Fortna, if we're looking at a 1% increase, we're looking at 8.08. .08. And if we're looking at a 0.5% increase, it is 7.83. So, uh, so we're about a 7.95. Yes, somewhere below in that range, yes. And Mr. Mr. Forbes, when you talk about everything coming in as you hope, does that is that taking into account the what we're expecting as that clawback, or is that not? That's as of today. So that is not not losing that 165 or whatever we think we might lose. Right, and if, and if uh, that were to happen, if it's 165, there's things that you can do because you haven't transcended into the new year yet. You can take a look back through at some of the things that maybe we were gonna fix or buy or, or some such and, and kind of do it on the front end. If it's a mid-year cut and it comes through say next February where the bulk of your costs other than labor have been spent already, then it gets a lot more challenging. I personally don't think if a cut's coming that it's gonna be February, I think it'll be in the next month. Yeah. So what you're saying, just to put it in my own terms so I understand it, is if we find out at the end of this month uh, that the governor's decided he, he is taking 50% of that of that pandemic adjustment, there's things that we can do in the last fisc last month of the fiscal year to mitigate some of that some of that loss. Yeah, and, and part of that becomes other things too. If the effects of the cut are statewide. You're going to have districts that we're currently scheduled to play events against, for example, that we may not have anybody to play. So there's going to be savings there. We may have other opportunities to make cuts that that uh, you know that aren't there yet. So. There's some macabre humor here because what you just said is other districts uh, uh, are going to be in dire straits and won't be able to allow their children to do anything. So we're going to save money on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my side of it. That. Old. You are you are you are as cold as a cold water fish, Mr. Forbes. <laughs> I can't help myself now. <laughs> and now, Mr. Forbes, we're probably down into the twenty-five dollar range as the overall or average increase on that pomfret average that we use for the majority of our, our taxpayers. Uh, what it's going to do is uh, obviously not having the final equalized rates and all that stuff. It's going to 
and take your town of Pomfret rate down to 92 cents a thousand is projected. And in the presentation, I had you at $1.84. So roughly speaking, 20 bucks, somewhere in there. Okay. So we're, we're asking for 20 bucks. Per well, I want to make one point clear on that. It's not twenty dollars across every tax bill. Right. Right. Dollars based upon that. Someone, a, someone yeah. will hear me say twenty dollars in total, and that's not going to be the case for all properties. Sure. Totally understand. But just as a benchmark to know kind of where we might be. Correct. Got it. Any other questions, comments from the board? Uh, first of all, I hate to, I, I'd like to apologize for causing all this confusion in the first place by, by uh, talking about the tax levy when I wasn't supposed to be talking about the tax levy. <laughs> I'll take responsibility for that. Um, uh, but I do, now I, I, I figure that 1% is a, I feel comfortable with 1%. And the reason why is that, is that I feel like we can go down to it, but I'm really, now kind of worried about going farther than that. Um, so for me, and that, all of the reasons that we discussed as far as the unknowns and um, the things that, you know, the state might impose on us, might not, um, you know, the all, the all the things that financially we might be facing, not this year, but also next year as well. Um, I do have a concern going below 1%. So I'm, I'm hoping, I, I, would, I would hope that we would be able to keep it around 1%. Any other comments from the board? I'm, I'm in agreement with Mr. Forster. Makes me nervous. I, I'm, <clears throat> yeah. I, I am, I'm the same. I think coming down to 1%, um, <clears throat> is, is responsible and still is taking into account what is happening in our community while allowing us to continue to provide services and, and prepare ourselves for what might be coming, which we just don't know. Yeah, I, I feel terrible for our community. I feel terrible for our kids, <clears throat> terrible for us, but um, I still feel, you know, the 1% will protect us for upcoming years. And it's, it's tough. It's a, you can't crystal ball any of this, but there are just a lot of bad things that can come mm -hmm. our way. And, uh, I'm, I'm still at 1%. Um, <clears throat> I take everybody's, um, everybody's percentage here <clears throat> and they're trying to come up with a compromise. Um, we've got, uh, Ms. Powell Fortin at 1.5%, uh, Mr. Forrester at 1%, Mr. Hawk at zero, Ms. Gaggenstatz at one, Mr. Johnson at one, and Mr. Jambrone at one, um, you know how I am. I'm, I'm right at 0.75. Okay. Um, okay. But if you take all that and the average of all of that is going to be 0.75. So, you know, we've got two board members here that are at zero. Um, I'm, I'm just asking for some kind of a, <clears throat> at some kind of a compromise that, again, uh, no one gets exactly what they want, but no one doesn't get anything. Mr. Hawk, you had a comment? You clarified it. Thank you. So, Mr. Hall, <laughs> just, just to, just to explain where, where we are right now, there's a motion on the floor for a 0.75 uh, um, increase to the tax levy. Um, and at some point, 
uh, that motion needs to be voted on. Um, that doesn't mean there can't be further discussion. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you understood. I want to remind you of the motion that you made and it's on the floor. Um, <clears throat> that the next step is, is either further discussion or a vote by the board. Was that seconded? Did we have a second on that? You did. You did, Mr. Jambron. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? Okay. With no further discussion, <clears throat> uh, I think we'd have to do a roll call on this, Ms. Slegel. You don't have to, but you can request one. Why don't we request one, please? Sure. And, and just state what it is again. It's for 0.75%? A 0.75 increase in the tax levy with the, um, with the adjustments being made to the reserves to balance the bug. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'll begin, uh, Mr. Aldrich. Yes. Mr. Forster. I'm sorry, you're muted, Mr. Forster. Yes, I was muted. Um, no. <laughs> Ms. Gagenschatz? No. Mr. Jambrone? Yes. Mr. Hawk? Yes. And Mr. Johnston? No. You forgot. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Mrs. Fortnite. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to say no. Okay. So that does not pass. So I will, uh, I will open up the floor to a new motion. I'm not sure if everyone could hear Mr. Aldridge. He said he opened the floor for a, for a new motion. I'd like to make a motion for a 1% increase. And Ms. Jagenstadt, are you seconding that? Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're proposing a 1% uh, tax levy increase with the, the balance being adjusted by the, uh, by the reserves of the district. <laughs> Mr. Forbes, Any what would discussion you on that? Hold on one second, Mr. Aldrich. Mr. Forbes, what would the estimated school tax levy be at 1%? Uh, $1.23 in the town of Pomfret. Okay. And what is the, and the increase in percent that's proposed is uh, 1.0. I believe you shared the amount that would be raised via taxes at 0.75. Can you share the same for 1.0%? 16 million two nineteen nine forty nine. Do you have that, Ms. Lagle? Say it again one more time for me, John. 16 219 949. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Aldrich, you can continue with discussion. Okay, so that is an increase. Uh, from the prior motion of uh, approximately $40,000. Correct. Okay. Any discussion on this? Ms. Mm -hmm. Slagle. Are we ready for a roll, roll call? call vote, okay. Mr. Aldrich? Yes. Mr. Forrester? Yes. Ms. Gagenschatz? Yes. 
Mr. Jambrone? Um, no. <clears throat> Mr. Hawk? No. <clears throat> Mr. Johnston? Yes. And Mrs. Fortna? Yes. Okay, that passes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I, you know, I understand that uh, uh, this is this is a challenging situation, and I appreciate everyone's uh, everyone's input. Um, moving on to item number six within personnel. Um, if I could have a motion um, to approve the resignation of Sterling Stearns. Mr. Johnston, and if I could get a second on that. Ms. Powell Fortna. Um, Mr. Sertistio. Just want to take a moment to congratulate Mr. Stearns. Uh, he has been appointed as an elementary principal in the Silver Creek School District. Um, this is a, a position that he's espoused to attain for a number of years. He served the district uh, as, a, as an assistant principal at the elementary and the high school. Um, and I know he will be sorely missed. Uh, he's been a good partner to both Mr. Paschke and Ms. Piper. Uh, we wish him well in his new endeavors mm -hmm. and we're proud of him as well. Good. Any questions? If not, if I could have a, uh, uh, a lift of hands of all members, board members, uh, approving that resignation. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Yeah, I didn't go mute, sorry. Um, we have a uh, resignation by Mr. Certistio, the superintendent, uh, effective July 1st of 2020. Um, if I could get a motion to accept that resignation. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll make that motion. Sadly. Yeah, it's chat. Uh, I don't think we're going to get a second. Mr. Forster, <laughs> seconded. Mr. Forster. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, um, well, I, I don't expect you to uh, make a comment, Mr. Certicio, but um, Mr. Aldridge. You know, over the past three years, I, I appreciate your dedication and hard work to the district. Um, yes. I, uh, if Certicio. you don't mind, I, if you don't mind, I, I would like to make some comments. So do you mind? <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll go after you then. Um, that's probably appropriate. But I, I just want to take a moment to thank the Board of Education, including former board members, Michael Bob, Bob Seen and Dan Ihouse for the trust and belief you, belief you placed in me these past three years. Through the board's guidance and with its support, there are a number of accomplishments I'd like to briefly highlight. At the board's direction, the school safety advisor position was created. The position, unique to Fredonia, has served the district's needs quite well and has become a model for others to follow. Of course, the capital project led by the facilities committee really has been a great success. At the completion of the, as, the, as the completion of the project nears, it's important to point out that, that it's under budget and it's significantly different than what was originally planned in a number of areas. I want to thank the facilities committee, the, uh, the board and members of the district for allowing me to have some influence on the project, especially uh, and the areas of properly securing the entryways. There really are too many facets of the project to list uh, because it's so wide, wide ranging. But in my view, it's been a great success and it will benefit the district students for years to come. 
On the academic side, uh, our, our work there um, were really two major initiatives that have had a direct and positive impact on the lives and education of the district's children. Of course, I'm speaking about the creation of the Early Childhood Center at Wheelock and the much overdue reconfiguration of the middle school. I wanna point out that both of these transitions were completed with no additional impact to the district's taxpayers. District-wide elements of MTSS can be seen at all levels and I encourage the team to continue to pursue its implementation as focusing on the individual needs of students will only continue in its importance. I've enjoyed my time meeting and working with Fredoni students, families, community, and of course the faculty and staff. In a relatively short time, I believe, I believe I've made some fairly deep connections which makes parting ways difficult. I want to acknowledge and thank each member of the administrative team for their work and dedication, dedication to, to the district and to me personally. This is an outstanding group of educational leaders who work collegially and collaboratively. The fact that I may have had some influence on this team is a point of personal pride. Finally, I want to take, I want to personally acknowledge the three folks who I've uh, grown closest to and come to rely on deeply. Joe Rada, you certainly have the institutional knowledge that I lack, and you are much more than a sneeze guy. I appreciate how quickly you accepted me and offered me advice. I truly appreciate the professionalism displayed as you tackle new duties and assignments and know the district is a better place for those efforts. Christine, you know how deeply I believe in you and how much I trust you. Thank you for allowing me to let my guard down even before I decided, or more aptly, was told I needed to be more vulnerable. This district was lucky to steal you away from Southwestern <clears throat> as you made such a difference here. And you've made me a better superintendent. Thank you. And finally, John Forbes. You've dedicated over 32 years of your professional career to this district. Your leadership along with the board support of the regions of the district is in great position to weather the current economic downturn. You are fond of saying that you are, you are on 24 seven and somehow that is an understatement for the time and effort you pour into this district. You have handled adversity and difficulty with dignity and aplomb. You too are a trusted confidant and one I will sorely miss. Of course, there's much work ahead of, all, of us and only a few weeks to accomplish much of it. I want the board and the community to know that over the next month or so, we'll be examining what may be needed to do to reopen the district to students and staff and we'll be developing plans to do so. This will be a, uh, a team effort that will hopefully culminate in returning the pitter patter of little feet and big ones too, to the hallways of this wonderful district. Again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutizio. Um, The work that you have done here doesn't go unknowledged um, and unappreciated either. Um, there has been there has been strides made, and yes, we wish we had uh, been able to keep you longer to to finish out some of those uh, those tasks. But um, I do appreciate your dedication and hard work uh, to make this district better. Um, through your leadership, we have navigated some difficult times and we find our district in a greater position uh, to get through the difficult times that we face ourselves now, um, that we know are coming. Uh, we wish you the best. Uh, we, we, we know that even, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Nobody's here to give me water. <clears throat> we know that Eden. <clears throat> <clears throat> we know that Eden has got a good school district uh, and a good superintendent. Thank you. <laughs> I gotta get some water. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just text Cameron. She brings me more water. I thought everyone knew how to, had that set up. Yeah. Oh man, sorry about that. If I got a frog in my throat, 
before. I stole my wife's water. Now she's mad at me. <laughs> um, any other comments from the board? Oh, thank you. Um, all those in favor? Oops. Yes. All those in favor of accepting Mr. Saticio's resignation, uh, please signify by raising your hand. Thank you, thank you very much. Best of luck, Mr. Certicio. Thank you. <clears throat> we have uh, uh, announcements and board correspondence. Uh, the district will conduct a, an adjourned budget hearing and regular meeting on Tuesday, May 26th. The uh, uh, virtual Zoom meeting uh the live stream will be through our website at the Fredonia School District. Um, you may the budget hearing may email oh that doesn't make sense. Uh, you may email questions on the budget hearing to Ms. Slagle uh, at the school district, uh, and they may be, they will be read and discussed during the meeting. Uh, the annual budget, the annual district budget vote and Board of Education election will take place Tuesday, June 9th, 2020 via absentee ballot only. Eligible district voters will receive an absentee ballot and return envelope with postage included in the mail. For more information regarding this process, please visit our district website at www.fredonia.wnyric.org. Um, since we have not received any messages from the public, um, Mr. Certicio, do you have any further comments? I appreciate the discussion and discourse this evening you know, amongst the board. I think what you settled on is, is, is a fair uh, budget proposal for our taxpayers. I hope that I hope they uh, agree as well. Um, I hope they vote. Um, the, the, um, and I think I've said everything I, I needed to say in my little speech there. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hawk, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> okay, Mr. Gambrone. No, thank you. Okay, Mr. Forrester. No, thank you. Uh, Ms. Gaggenschatz. Nothing further, thanks. Ms. Powell Fortner. Nothing additional. Mr. Johnson. Uh, no, Ms. Aldrich. Okay. Um, I'll go through the principles. Any additional things uh, that is going on in your buildings? Ms. Piper. I just want to thank the teachers for everything that they're continuing to do to reach out to the students and the parents and families for continuing to engage um, doing all that they can for their kids and I appreciate it. And a shout out to Mr. Sertisio. Thank you for everything. We'll miss you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Drowling here. Just a thank you to the community. Um, they came and picked up some packets today for the kids and it was good to see a lot of people. And uh, just mm -hmm. a thank you to Mr. Sertisio. Uh, Ms. Troutman. Uh, just thank you for the teachers. We, the last two days, they've come in and worked on their room, so it was nice to have them in the building. And again, thank you to Mr. Sorticio, and good luck. Uh, Mr. Paskey. 
Many thanks to the to our teachers and community for their continued efforts as we uh, start to close out the school year. Uh, this tremendous, tremendous effort and, and caring and uh, amazingness uh, going on every day. The um, our, our graduation plan have uh, ramped up. Uh, we did meet with a, a group of some people yesterday. We're getting some estimates for some cool things to add. Uh, just to share a little bit, um, we are hoping to have kind of a, a drive-in style uh, graduation where students will be able to still cross the stage one at a time, uh, not having a bunch of people on a stage, but they will be crossing a stage and uh, being able to get their diplomas and, and hopefully be able to cross their tassels together uh, one last time. Uh, and, and we're looking at having that currently in our, our school uh, parking lot, if that will work. And uh, mm -hmm. just wanted to give a little bit more information to, to those that I know are anxious to get it. So that's where we are right now. Um, we luckily have uh, come into a little bit of money in the sense that um, our, sadly, our, our senior class night, all night uh, party that typically goes on had to be canceled but we do have uh, a, a nice sum of money from that to help uh, with, with some of the unforeseen uh, additions to making this graduation extra special for all of our seniors. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, and then, well, I guess not lastly, second to last uh, to Mrs. Fortna. Um, I apologize that uh, I, I forgot to say this when I was talking about the, the coursework, but um, in, in this, the environmental science class uh, that, that we brought back, that is also receiving credit from SUNY Fredonia. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the students do have to pay $75 to get that credit, but uh, it, it is a, a SUNY Fredonia credit bearing course. And I, that just left my mind. I apologize for not bringing that up during the report, but thanks to uh, the, the live action texting that goes on during our, our, <laughs> our meetings, I was able to get that information from our science team. So thank you for that. Uh, lastly, Mr. Sertisio, thank you so much for all you've done uh, uh, for me personally, professionally. Uh, just just thanks. Wish you the best of luck and, uh, and favor when you get to your new district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Passy. Uh, Mr. Forbes. Yes. Uh, to Mr. Sertisio, first, I'd like to thank him for his comments. They're uh, greatly appreciated. And I would like to thank someday when I have a retirement letter on the table that people will have the opinion of me that I've given everything I can give to Fredonia. I have to tell you a quick story that I had the unique opportunity, which some of the board members may not know, uh, in the interview process this time to interview each of the candidates individually and then participate in the administrative group as well. Uh, I had done that in the previous round and David O'Rourke thought that was good that I continue that. And I remember coming home and telling my wife that I was very impressed by this candidate that I had and that we spent a good amount of our time chit-chatting about fishing, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, I, I really enjoyed having him as superintendent, other than it took a while to get used to these sudden appearances in my office because when I'm working on my computer, when I'm in the office, my back is to my door and all of a sudden he would be standing there, uh, which was a little bit of a surprise from what I'm used to. I would say that today is a day that Fredonia has a loss and Eden has definitely a gain, and we appreciate all that he gave to the district. Thank you. Thank you for those words, Mr. F Mr. Forbes. Mr. Rada. Oh, I just want to uh, reach out to Mr. Sertesio and say congratulations again. Thank you for the kind words. Um, working in the district office is a very surreal place at times, and uh, we've had a grand adventure for the last three years. Um, some of the highlights, definitely, your birthdays were always a wonderful thing. Um, good luck to you at Eden. Thank you for not mentioning the song that I put on repeat in our first holiday get together. Because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. That's the we story just thought you time. liked that artist. <laughs> yeah. That'll be part of your roast, don't worry. <laughs> Ms. Farrell. Um, sure, I just wanted to echo the sentiments of thanks to the parents, the teachers, and teachers community, um, and a special thanks to Mr. Sorticio for all the support and leadership over the years, and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Mrs. 
Ms. Slagle. I don't typically have Last, much but to say. Not I don't. I don't typically have much to say, but I could. I could probably talk forever about Jeff, um, but I can't do it for very long without crying. So um, y you've seen. You could see it on my face um, how much this is difficult for me. Um, he's been incredibly influential to me, um, and I will miss him terribly. And I can't say much more um, without without crying. So um, good luck to you. Uh, Eden is very lucky. Thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> uh, being no further business, if I could get a motion to dismiss the meeting. Mr. Hawk and Ms. Gaggenschatz. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. By raising your hand, excuse me. Yes, thank you. We are now adjourned. We'll see you in a week. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.